When it comes to all-around horsemen, Yorkshire trainer Mark Johnston must rate near the top. A qualified veterinarian, he has won more races than any other trainer in British history and buys large volumes of yearlings from the sales each year. So when he talks, people tend to listen. Johnston had some strong opinions on the BHA's review of the buying and selling of racehorses released late last year. So we spoke with him about that, as well as a handful of the exciting prospects in his stable. Mark, you have a few exciting three-year-old fillies in your yard, starting with last year's Queen Mary and Duchess of Cambridge winner raffle prize. What is the plan for her when racing gets going again? The plan would have been that raffle prize was heading directly to the English guineas, and she probably will still do that. The guineas come in first week in June. Now, that's fantastic if it happens, and I would say that we would still make that raffle prize his first target. You know, it's been a case of keeping these horses ticking over and not being able to sort of put the finishing touches this way. We aren't quite sure when they're going to run. Rose of Kildare was another nice filly for you last year winning two Group 3s from a busy season of 12 starts. What's the plan for her? Rose of Kildare, the thought was to run in a Guineas trial with a view to making a decision as to whether to go to the English Guineas or wait for the German Guineas. Now, the German Guineas is in late June now, I think. It's going to be a hard decision with her, you know, possibly based on how she works at home over the next couple of weeks as to whether we would take the plunge and go to the English guineas without a, a trial or whether we would look for something a bit lower grade with a view to going to the German guineas if we're allowed to do so. And West End Girl won the Sweet Solera for you last year. Are you thinking guineas with her as well or potentially longer trips? West End Girl, we're a bit less sure of where we're going with her and a bit less sure about optimum trips. I'm sure we wouldn't be pitching in at Group 1 level with her. We'll be trying to get a feel for her first, and I'm not really sure at this stage what races will be available. Ellercam was a horse that really started to come good for you last year after showing promise from the beginning. What would be the plan for him this year? Ellercam, you know, one that we he's been absolutely bouncing through the winter, uh, looking great. We were very much looking forward to running him. There was talk of the Brigadier Gerard being moved from Sandown to Newmarket, that it might run on the 5th of June. If it does whatever track it's on, then I think we'd be keen to get him out. As I say, he's really been flying, and Group 1 has got to be the aim. But if last year was anything to go by, probably needs the first one just to put the finishing touches on, and something like the, the Brigadier Gerard would be a nice start for him. That's great to hear. Shifting subjects, you wrote a piece shortly after the review of the buying and selling of racehorses was made public that drew some attention. You said you thought the writers of the review didn't seem to understand how a horse is valued. Can you explain why you think that? I think in there they were suggesting that it was what the price was set by what the purchaser is prepared to pay, when in fact that's not the case. As I say, you know, in a private sale, yeah. what usually happens is a bit of a Dutch auction and the, the, the purchaser makes an offer, uh, the vendor assumes the purchaser is willing to pay a bit more, asks for more, and they meet somewhere in between. And I'm not sure, as I say, that the, the authors of that report grasp the idea that it's not what the purchaser is prepared to pay, because you know, if the purchaser is prepared to pay 100000 uh, and the vendor doesn't know that, then, then the vendor is prepared to sell at 50000 then mm -hmm. the, the horse is going to sell for fifty, or what the underbidder was prepared to pay, because somebody has to bid against the buyer. At Tattersalls, you've got the situation where the reserve is effectively made public. The auctioneer states when the horse is on the market. This effectively means that the majority of professional bidders will not bid until they know the horse is on the market. So it's not the, there's not really that simple option as there would be at Keeneland or at Goffs of just put a, a reserve on and leave it to the auctioneer. The vendor almost has no choice but to bid to and to put the horse on the market, um, which may seem underhand to some people, but 
the system sort of drives him to do it. You've also obviously got the potential situation where there is only one buyer. As I say, in Keeneland or in Goths, you could just put your reserve on and leave it to the auctioneer to take that one buyer up to the reserve. In Tattersalls, somebody has to bid against him. You also said you found it concerning that the authors of the report thought bidding up a horse to be a problem because they said it results in an artificially inflated price. Can you explain why you found that concerning? I don't deny you get some vendors who will gamble and they'll think, well, you know, he's unlikely to stop. Then they might gamble and bid beyond their minimum. I still feel that they are entitled to do, provided if they don't sell it, they're willing to take it home. You know, so I, I do find when I'm buying myself, you, know, you will often get the situation where you bid in the ring the animal is led out as unsold or, or sold or knocked down as sold and you don't know who it's sold to. Um, and then the vendor approaches you afterwards and says, that horse wasn't sold. Are you willing to stand on at what you bid? So, you know, I bid 50,000 in the ring. The horse is knocked down as sold at 55. And they come to me afterwards and say, will you give 50 for it? I always say no. <laughs> I usually say, you know, know, I'm not interested now. If I'm desperate to have the horse, I offer less because I assume that we've been running just the two of us bidding. That's a frustration at times that the vendor will gamble and bid against you when he's actually willing to sell the horse for less. But, you know, it outs in the end. You know, my simple principle is I set my limit and I, I stop at it. When it becomes corruption, is when that vendor knows what an agent is willing to pay and is running the horse up to in a, a previously agreed price. You know, that is clearly fraudulent. And that's what they should have been focusing on, not just the simple idea of the vendor genuinely bidding against the purchaser. I think they touched on it, but it seemed that they had missed the, the crucial point, you know, that it's, it's collusion between agents and vendors to fix the price that is the issue they should have been concentrating on. Yes, that kind of corruption is very concerning and potentially damaging to the industry. Is there a way that type of behavior could be curtailed or stopped? The sales companies would have to have a zero tolerance approach to it and be willing to to prosecute somebody who is found doing something which is clearly fraudulent. Because I'm sure there is corrupt practice goes on, and there are those things which are clearly fraudulent, like colluding to fix a price and basically steal from a, a buyer. But I suppose there are other practices in their report they had assumed that the only beneficiary from achieving a higher price was the vendor. They hadn't considered the whole idea of inflating stallion values and yearling averages and um, and basically boosting the market and playing the market. And really, that's a some more complicated side of it, which was a bit beyond the people doing the report, and they clearly hadn't considered it. Some of those practices are a bit more of a grey area as to whether they're actually fraudulent. But I think the starting point would be to, as I say, have a, a, a zero tolerance attitude to anything which was clearly illegal. You know, we have to, to face up to those clear cut things that we need to operate within the law of the land. And a starting point would be for the regulators, you know, it's even a grey area as to whether the BHA um, have any power over the, the sales process. But, you know, I think at all stages, those involved should have a, a zero tolerance attitude to any criminal activity. Mark, thank you for your time. We appreciate your input. 